Victor y Casares. Welcome to Talking Theater Friends. Uh, sorry, I, I've been trying to, you gave your play, wait, what are we calling it? Is it a play, a show? It's a play. I, I'm calling okay. it a play. It's a very limited, it's an extremely limited series. Um, I like and, that. It sounds very like, <laughs> like, I don't know, like HBO presents. <laughs> so it's kind of like a, it's like a Tong, whatever, Trabalenguas is, uh, Penny, Pinching Pennies with Penny Marshall. Obviously you did that on purpose, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like, there's just something really hilarious about pinching pennies. Uh, like, ooh, yeah, there's something really hilarious about pinching pennies, and and it's so blasé. Like, I I just didn't. The title is almost boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I love like, the title so much. <laughs> it's like, oh, let's do financial things. <laughs> financial things. So, would you like to tell our viewers and our listeners what pinching pennies with Penny Marshall is? Pinching pennies with Penny Marshall. Uh, so the, the whole, like, so it's, it's a really weird title. So it's Pinching Pennies with Penny Marshall. And then there's the episode title. And then afterwards is uh, Death Rituals for Penny Marshall, um, if that makes any sense. And it's a play, uh, and it's an extremely limited series where uh, Penny Marshall is giving uh, people financial advice. Uh, she has discovered Zoom webinars at, and the pandemic as an opportunity to uh, tell people what to do and have them pay for, and then have them pay for, and then have them pay her for this advice. Uh, and over the course of the series, we see sort of like the sort of rusty beginnings, uh, and then she catapults to fame. Um. <laughs> it is hilarious. I watched the first episode and I couldn't get enough of the actor playing Penny Marshall. And I'm like, why, <laughs> why Penny? Yeah, why, why Penny Marshall? Uh, so, so the actor that plays Penny Marshall is uh, one of my best friends. We've been friends since high school. Uh, they were my first kiss, uh, my first uh, queer gay kiss. Uh, and um, we, we both grew up in El Paso. Um, and uh, Penny Marshall, I saw her Academy interviews, her like, inter you know, like the, the television Academy has like interviews like people like from the television industry that have like had a huge impact. And I think in 2016, 2017, she filmed hers. And she's, this is like after she survived cancer, after she's just like done everything. Uh, and she is wearing this like fabulous cape, amazing highlights in her hair. And she just doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't give a fuck if you're along with her for the ride or not and it's just like the most it was the, the interviews are a delight like she's both like really smart and also doesn't give up and like sort of clueless about some things and just doesn't give a fuck and I and I just like loved loved the affect and the performance of that and thought that was brilliant and this was like maybe three years ago uh and every year I go back to El Paso with my partner uh to be with my family uh, and uh, for the for the Las Navidades, and we, I like have organized for I think for the last ten years um, a live nativity, uh, like a, a pastorela. It's not really a pastorela, but it's a pastorela live nativity at a at a gay bar named Chiquitas, and it's a dive bar. It's like the diviest of bars. It used to be, uh, and it also gentrified. Um, and uh, one year the theme or the year she died, um, like maybe two or three days before she died, I decided to make the theme uh, Penny Marshall Christmas. It was like uh, JC, JC Penny Marshall's Presents a Penny Marshall Live Nativity. Uh, and uh, we went out, uh, went to Savers, gathered costumes, and Jesus just looked uncannily like Penny Marshall. And like, they're so good at accents. And they just like did this ridiculous impression of Penny Marshall. Um, and then that just like stayed squirreled away in my mind. It's like, oh, I want to do something with this, but I don't know what. And then the pandemic happened. And um, one of the fellows at New York Theater Workshop, like, or the fellows organized like a, uh, an evening, a virtual uh, day of work, of like new work. And they asked me to contribute something. And one of the fellows, Borna, who's directing the piece said, write about OnlyFans, Victor. And just something just like snapped in my mind. And it's like, Penny Marshall. OnlyFans webinar, uh, and like, <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> it was really just a joke, uh, but it's become a very serious endeavor for me. 
And it's like, I love how unabashedly queer it is. Because I feel like right now everyone's talking about OnlyFans and people don't necessarily like take, people don't necessarily know what it means even, I think. <laughs> so can you, you know, like once you were giving that challenge, it's almost like a RuPaul's Drag Race, like do, you know, like do OnlyFans. That's your massive <laughs> challenge for this week. Once you're given that, how do you access that and turn, I mean, how do you turn that into uh, the three episodes that, uh, that are going to be released? I, I mean, I, I can't, but like, I can't but be clear. I can't but be like this person from the border and like be just like unabashedly myself, right? Like these, and like, these are, these are both like, these are also the reasons why like my career has taken so long to get anywhere. Um, because like people, people like to talk about like, oh, we like to do queer work. Oh, we like to do Latinx work. Well, not mine. Um, <laughs> it's like a little too much. Um, and the other thing about it, like, my, like, I don't really explain what OnlyFans is in the play. I just assume people will know. <laughs> but also like OnlyFans, so OnlyFans started as this, um, as a site where you could pay people a monthly, a monthly subscription and they would upload, you'd have access to uh, sexual pornographic videos that a performer would upload. Um, and it, like the fees range anywhere from five to a delusional like hundred dollars or something. And a delusional, not on the side of the sex workers, but on the side of the Disney Channel stars that are now on OnlyFans. Uh, so OnlyFans is being gentrified by by ex Disney Channel stars, um, which I, I didn't write that, but it sounds so ridiculous. <laughs> um, and yeah, did that answer the question? I, I, I yeah. Rats. Sorry. So I was gonna, no, don't worry. I was gonna <laughs> say that. Like, even OnlyFans is being gentrified, which is like insane. Like, in a way, it kind of feels like you were predicting what would happen. <laughs> it's it's been the the, the um, there have been a lot of crazy uh, little uh, I don't know what to call them cosmic events around this play, like uh, Penny Marshall and uh, her show Laverne and Shirley have been clues in the crossword over the last month. Just, you, you know, like, <laughs> and I'm like, how is this happening? Also, like, she was becoming a financial, so in, like, in the second, uh, in the second episode, she becomes, spoilers, uh, she becomes a sort of financial spiritual advisor to, like, corporate executives. Um, and this is real. I, I didn't know about this until, like, maybe, like, a month or two ago. Like, these corporations are hiring spiritual advisors over Zoom uh, for their corporate offices and like doing like uh, just like esoteric stuff that is all just like neoliberal, right? But like they're just like sh giving it the sheen of spiritualism, uh, which is just so bizarre. <laughs> that is pretty bizarre. Like, I'm really curious about what is the act of creating in quarantine? Like, how it was doing this different than? when you've written your other works or when you've done other shows? Um, it's, it's one of the ways it's different is that it's getting produced. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it was really, it was really, it's just up and down. Uh, like there was that week here. I, I, so I live in Portland and we had um, the fires and the smoke and it, it blocked out the sun for a week. Um, and just psychologically, it, it just like really messed with us. And I think like it traumatized, traumatized us. And like, I was recuperating for like two weeks. I, and, that's, and that's like speaking as someone like, who did not have their home endangered. So I, I cannot imagine what like the people who like lost their homes to the fire are going through right now. But just like as an environmental catastrophe, uh, it was it was really it was really tough um, to to write in that, um, but then I harnessed it. I was like, oh well, this is like something I'm going through, um, and maybe I can write about it. And in other ways, uh, it doesn't feel. I started from this place of like, oh, I'm writing during quarantine, but then as I got more into it, it just felt like like all my other uh, sort of crazy out of the box um, 
<laughs> out of the box uh, plays, you know, like I, my other plays are sort of like impossible to produce uh, or not impossible to produce, but like they're really just like, they're really out there. Like my, uh, one of my plays, uh, Ramses contra los monstruos, uh, Salmos para el fin del mundo. So it's like Ramses against the monsters, Psalms for the end of the world is about uh, this guy that work that dissolves bodies for the cartels. And uh, one day one of his bodies curses him so that they don't dissolve anymore. And it's a queer love story. Um, <laughs> and then another play like that, like New York Theater Workshop uh, was going to produce this year, this fall, had the pandemic not happened. Uh, American televisions is a, a very tech heavy show done through a lot of televisions on, on stage. Uh, and it's like the tragedy of like this undocumented family living in the shadow of the first Walmart in the entire universe. Um, so like, I, I, have, I have this scope that like goes beyond the real world, um, but I think like really just reflects it in this like bizarre, in bizarre ways, right? Like I think like his life is stranger than anything we could ever write. Um, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> and you also kind of need that, you know, like supernatural element or that like sci-fi or fantasy element, right? Sometimes to cope with all the insanity going on in the world. Yeah, well, it's a reaction. Like, it's also a reaction against like a lot of a lot of things, a lot of like narratives, a lot of TV, for example. Like, there's too much continuity uh, in our narratives um, right now. And like, I I say this a lot, but I think like a, like linear storytelling leads to genocide, and you know, here we are. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just like it's a reaction against. Uh, it's a reaction against a lot of things, but one of the things it is, is it's against continuity. Um, I feel like early on in like our television history, for example, um, a lot of TV shows like were commissioned as pilots and then they figured it out as it went along. Like, so like things that happened in the pilot weren't necessarily canon. They didn't necessarily stick around and they like continually changed storylines. And now the TV shows are all figured out like they're figured out from the moment they like before they even get like uh like before like the episode starts shooting right everything is figured out like all the continuities make sense and everything is delivered as like this is all fact um and i think and there used to be this time where you were delivered something in an episode of your favorite tv show that wasn't necessarily in line with everything you've been told so you were always on your toes <laughs> you knew not to believe these people necessarily um, and I wanted to mine some of that. Um, so like continuity errors are, are not a bug, they're a feature. <laughs> they're delicious also. Like I love, I love Sex and the City and I also love the Carrie Diaries, which have you seen the Carrie Diaries? <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> okay. Anyway, all my friends are like, it's not canon. And I'm like, who gives a fuck? <laughs> yes. Give me not the canon. Like I don't want the canon. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in many ways, uh, from the works that you, I mean, I, I, I was only able to read the scripts. And I was only able to watch the first episode, but I was like looking at your resume and like, I love how you're basically like combining all this, you know, like, like the Las Películas de Monstruos, no? Like having like yeah. El Santo battle, like someone else. And I wonder how for you navigating, you know, like you grew up going between, um, crossing the border basically, right? Like going back yeah. and forth from the US and Mexico. And as a playwright, I wonder how often did it happen to you that people would try to like pin you down and be like, this is the kind of story that you can tell. And this is the kind of story that you can't tell. And how, when you present them with this like hybrids of like genres and like no continuity, can you talk a little bit about the challenges that I, that I guess that that's presented in your life as, a, as an artist? I have a note card here that says, don't start shit, Victor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, uh, I've been told, like, uh, here we go. Um, I, oh God, it, it's like, it's, it's sort of emotional um, because, and it's, and it's not, and it's not from white people. Um, it's from Latinx people that think that like I don't present a good story about 
Latinx people, right? That like respectability politics of the wazoo. Um, because like I write about drugs. I write about, um, I wrote about drugs. I'm from the border. I grew up around like violence. I grew up around a fucking like drug war. Um, like these are not just like somebody else's stories. These are my stories. And being told, I don't want to produce like uh, plays about drugs, guns, or gangs. <laughs> it's just like, I thought you were supposed to be on my side. <laughs> and it's just like, that's what I write about. Like I write about drugs. I write about like, how we're not model citizens because we don't sh we should not be model citizens in order to have human rights in order to have like our stories told um and like running up against people not wanting to produce uh just like specifically because of of drugs specifically because i wrote about like drug culture and the drug wars um really made me feel like i was not worthy like not just like my like for a while, like I was like, my writing isn't worthy. And like, I know that's not true. Like I, I write better plays than a lot of the white Latinx playwrights that get produced. And they get produced because they tell easy stories that are like sort of positive. Um, don't get me started. <laughs> and, um, and so like there was that, and also just like that, oh, like drug is like, my drug addiction is something to be ashamed of, is something to hide, is something that like, also not just my drug addiction, but also like being paused, like, uh, like being paused is like not some, like is not a story that people want to hear, right? Cause like, uh, ever since like I see converted, um, which is like, um, maybe for non-disclosure reasons, I shouldn't say how many years ago, but like, it's been a while. Um, and, uh, it's uh, like all of my plays like since then have like some element of, of like of AIDS, HIV. Um, again, like things that you shouldn't be as like a model, a model citizen, a model playwright. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just like, I felt like this is my story and for whatever reason, because of bullshit reasons, like it's not being produced. Um, like I, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember where I was going. Well, I don't know, but that is bullshit when people say that. <laughs> but I, now I'm really curious. It's like, I just want to like, imagine like someone were to like grab like a big like cauldron, like una bruja de, de las caricaturas o algo así. And like, if someone were to grab like a big cauldron, like throw in a bunch of like artistic influences in movies and telenovelas and books and music, and then mix it <laughs> to end up with Victor y Cáceres, <laughs> what would be in there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean everything that is in my plays, right? Like there's like um <laughs> and also Thornton Wilder. <laughs> <laughs> and also Eugene Eugene O'Neill and Tennessee Williams. Um like I, I have like the, the I have the canon because like I, I've like I've I've been a geek, but I'm also not obsessed with it. Like I, I don't I don't feel I don't feel oppressed by it because I'm not the one I don't give it that power, right? Like I, I think like one of the other things of one of the blessings of like having my career take so long to like have any traction is that I developed this practice for myself. Like I I am successful on my own terms. Uh, and I'm gonna write for I'm gonna write for myself. And like that's like that's where I start. And um what goes into color like everything like just like all the telenovelas the good ones though because like i i have i have i'm very strict about which telenovelas i'll watch um like i haven't watched any telenovelas really since 2006. Um, oh my god same <laughs> <laughs> like they some a turn really like it things took a turn like they started to mimic american stuff like really hardcore uh but even even that I think is a lie um, because I, I rewatched Cuna de Lobos and I rewatched like some some other TV shows from the 80s. Yeah, um, which actually I'm not going to spoil it, but third episode is just like an homage to Catalina Cri. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the, the 80s, like the, that telenovela was mimicking or like was inspired by American American work. Uh, which I, I had no idea, like not just the anniversary, which is like the Betty Davis movie from the 60s, but um, the TV shows of the 80s, um, that, that sort of thriller um, and whodunit, like the, the Dallas, 
is it Dallas where it's like who shot JR? I think so. Yeah, either that or yeah, I think it's, it's Dallas. It's Dallas, right? Because it's some it dynasty, 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 right? So, yeah, so it's Dallas. Dynasty, someone's with it with the, with the shoulder, shoulder pads. pads and like the slaps. <laughs> <laughs> I love but, it so much because that's when I was watching the the first episode. I was like, you must have been a lot of fun to play with when you were a kid. <laughs> um yes uh and like i mean i think like somebody should probably call uh like some sort of authority on me because of like the things <laughs> i like <laughs> like we were like eight years old and i was directing telenovelas and like having like tr tr very traumatic storylines uh for my female uh friends and uh and sisters. <laughs> do, do you remember Muchachitas? I do. I do. I remember Muchachitas as I didn't watch it, but um, one of my like older second cousins um, who like lives in San Lorenzo uh, told me the whole storyline. And like she, like, <laughs> like and it, it's like it, for me, Muchachitas is oral history. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like I didn't get to watch it until YouTube. YouTube really changed my life. Um, I, mean, I got God to bless watch. You to write. I got to watch Silver Villas that I'd only heard about. Uh, and what else do you watch? Currently, or just like the history of, of watching? Yeah, what did you find? What did you find on YouTube? Uh, so I found uh, I found like the things that I'd only remember, like Corazón Salvaje, for example. I was oh. like five. Juan del Diablo. Uh, oh my God. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, and uh, the, the one with um, Eduardo Palomo, right? And Edith Gonzalez. Uh, like that one, not the trash that was produced with Araceli Arambula later. Um, <laughs> that was really bad. Uh, I also like Marisol, which is like a really trash telenovela. It's like with Erika Buenfil and Erika Buenfil, who has since become a YouTube uh, cooking sensation in Mexico and also a TikTok star. White Mexican TikTok is, is a mess uh, and she's a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been really funny. Like, I know we're jumping ships, but uh, the way that uh, racial privilege in Mexico has just like translate, like, just like comes from like the TV, like the way only, like, only white people are on TV, is just like being replicated on, on social media and TikTok, right? Like, they're all just like, all the people that are famous are super white or light skinned. Um, and like, those are the people that are being like watched, shared, and privileged and like featured on on their news, which is like not a surprise. Um, so it's a, Erika, so Marisol is about this girl who like crashed into a mirror, has this like ridiculous uh, scar. scar, and then is about like undoing that scar and the emotional scars as well. <laughs> oh my God. You know what my mom used to call me when I was little? She used to call me novel Novelita. She called you Novelita? Because I would watch telenovelas. The second I got home from school, Novelita. I would be like, novelas until 9 p.m. when they made me go to bed. <laughs> novelita. Oh, my God. Where did you grow up? In Honduras. Honduras. Oh, novelita. Yeah. And like, what, uh, did you get uh, just Mexican ones or also like Venezuelan ones and Brazilian ones? We got all of them, but I was always like, I love watching the Mexican ones. I never got into the Colombian ones because they were so long. Oh, right, and the Colombia too. Yeah, and so were the Venezuela ones. But I would, when I was like getting older, I would stay up past, you know, after hours because around 10 p.m. they would show all the Brazilian ones, which had, <laughs> they had, they had boobs <laughs> and butts. So I would stay up and I would like, you know, like not fall asleep on my desk <laughs> at school the next day because I was like so immersed into that. But, um, I know, right? I mean, I was novelita for a reason. But, oh, that's right? such a sweet name. I love it. You can you you can use it for uh, a character. I hope. Thank you. Thank you for this gift. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, what is your favorite Penny Marshall project, though? Like, what's do you have like a favorite like film? So I did not. So again, like I my my way to Penny Marshall is her interviews about her career <laughs> or like her lifetime achievement interview. Like that that is what that is what started this. And it is it was only after I watched uh, it was only after I wrote the first episode, which was back in June, that I was like, you know, I should maybe find out more about. <laughs> um, so I saw my first Laverne and Shirley episode maybe like two months ago 
I was sort of blown away. I, I thought I'd always heard about Laverne and Shirley, and I, I was like, oh, it's a sitcom from the '70s. It must be like a really, a really like straight um, narrative, right? Very based in reality. It is really bizarre. It is a really out there uh, TV show that makes zero sense. It is very absurd, um, which I was surprised by. And then I wrote um, Penny Marshall's autobiography, or not? Auto is it an autobiography? I don't know. It's her memoir. My mother was nuts. Um, and so I wrote this book and then I saw all the press that she did for it, which was just, it's just incredible. She just, <laughs> I, I, I can't, but like, just like go, can I, can I send you links and maybe you can post it like along with like this. Um, yeah. <laughs> she's amazing. And then, uh, yeah, cause I, I haven't seen a league of their own in like maybe 10, 15 years. Um, and I, when I was, a, and I think when I was a teenager, I saw, I, I really looked forward to it, writing in Cars with Boys, um, like with Drew Barrymore, uh, Penny Marshall directed that. And I remember really loving it, but then reading her memoir and finding out that she hated it, I was like, oh, I can't like it anymore. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, you, well, <laughs> well, apparently Drew Barrymore was not easy to work with. Um, and it was just like not like she wasn't happy, and so Penny wasn't happy. I love that instead <laughs> of like asking you questions about theater, I turned this into Ventaneando. <laughs> Ventaneando is one of my favorite evil shows. <laughs> <laughs> I love it too. And you know, in the in the spirit of Ventaneando, actually, I I was very curious because there's many times where the medium defines what the text you know, what to do with the text, right? And in your case, like right now, we're like, we're on Zoom right now and people are watching plays on Zoom and readings on Zoom. And then in your play, Zoom is essential to what's happening. So how was it for you to play with a form and a medium, not a form, but a medium that people are like, oh God, another Zoom? <laughs> oh, I, I, I always disregard medium. I like always, always like, I, I don't really care that we're doing this on stage, right? Like, I, I think one of one of the key moments in like my um, my education, or and just like theater going experience, just like as a person, uh, was going to. I was like in a study abroad program, um, a theater study abroad program, and we were based in London, but we also we took a like a, a trip to Paris, and we saw Ariane Manushkin's um, with like uh, Théâtre du Soleil's. Uh, La Dernière Caravanserie, I'm really bad with French. Uh, so the last caravanserie. And like the first, the first image we see um, is this like raging, roaring river. And it is done without like any digital, like obviously like no lighting effect. It's just this massive um, fabric. And maybe there are fans, but I think it's just people just like really, really rustling, like really creating this river and people trying to cross it. It's about, it's, it's about migration and refugees in Europe. And they just like cross, and it's just like, again, being from, <laughs> being from El Paso, being from Juarez, being from this border where people cross the river, it, it was just like, it, it, like I, I've seen, I've seen pictures, like my uncles have crossed that river um, it's, it, it was, it's not raging like the one I was seeing on stage, but like, I knew that and, and just like seeing that represented this impossible, impossible theatrical stage direction, <laughs> people cross a raging river on stage. It just like, it told me you could do anything, anything, anything is possible and everything is possible. In a talk back with the director afterwards, she said, theater can do everything, theater should do everything. And I have... Like that's what I that's what I have that's what I've always that's that's what I've always operated with um, and to me it's like, so it's like not so much about the medium it's just like I this is what I want to do and right now like this is our situation we're living on Zoom and so what does this world of Zoom look like um, and it's it's not a limitation I think it's a gift like it's a it's this opportunity to like here's this like it's entirely new way of of representing the world right like we we are to, like this is unprecedented and this is like 
it sucks as people. <laughs> but it can be very, like, very fascinating as, as like, as, as an audience, and I think as, as, like, as a creator, to just, like, find this entirely new circumstance that, like, we would have been told we were crazy for imagining. Mm -hmm. um, and so imagining Zoom, so, like, I, I, we, we stay on Zoom. Zoom is essential. But then there is like another framing device and another framing device, um, very much like Almodovar, uh, who's like one of my like um, gods, I guess. <laughs> I'm just You're like speaking my love language right now. Did you I, did you did you did you watch the the new uh, Tilda movie? Uh, what's it called? The human uh, voice. The human voice. I didn't. I, I I only watched like the the like the promo videos. Um, I haven't seen it. Should I? Yes, you should. <laughs> okay. It's like theater. It's like <laughs> quarantine theater. It is perfection. And like, it opens with Tilda and that huge Balenciaga red gown. It's it's like peak Almodovar. And the best okay. part is that he, he doesn't make um, Tilda speak Spanish. <laughs> oh, oh, so that, uh, I'm, that was one of the reasons why I hadn't seen it. I was like, I don't, I always feel weird when, I, I always feel weird when uh, like people like non-American uh, actors, like especially from like, um, or non-American directors, especially from like, um, you know, like the Spanish speaking countries or, or like, or Southern Europe, like uh, sort of uh, fetishize or canonize like white American actors um, or even British, uh, white British actors uh, because <laughs> says the playwright, who wrote a play about Penny Marshall. Uh, <laughs> uh, because, yeah, I mean, it's like, like all these white Mexican directors, right, that are like, just like obsessed with these American actors and like, they don't give like any work to non-white people. Um, <laughs> so like, yeah, so uh, I, I was a little hesitant because of all that. So I'm really happy to know that like, she's not speaking Spanish. I'll check it out yes. now. Well, this was a delight. And so I hope we can talk soon. I would love to talk to you more at some other point and please send me all the links. And before we go to our late meetings, would you like to invite our viewers and our listeners to tune in to Pinching Pennies with Penny Marshall? Yes, uh, please watch uh, the, first ep the first episode of Pinching Pennies with Penny Marshall, a financial advice Zoom webinar for OnlyFans content creators. Uh, it is this Monday at 7.30 Eastern time uh, and the New York, you can like get your tickets at the New York Theater uh, Workshop Org. And also follow Not Penny Marshall on Instagram. <laughs> awesome. Ha sido un placer, Victor. Gracias igualmente, José. Muchas que tengas gracias. un buen día. Hasta luego.